Hey everyone, I wanted to wish you a happy holidays. I know this is coming a little bit late, but tomorrow is New Year's Eve. So happy New Year's. I hope you spend it with those that you love in a safe manner. And hopefully next year we don't have to worry about this pandemic. 2020 has been crazy and I'm a little excited, probably more scared for what 2021 has to bring. But if you're looking for somebody to talk to, I know it can be a little bit lonely out there. Always know that you can shoot me a DM on Instagram and chat, good or bad. Always here for you guys. So what does 2021 look like for this podcast? Well, I'm going to try to at least get one episode out a week going forward. I know 2020 has been a little sporadic, and that's my bad. I'm going to try to be a little bit better. But I'm going to also try to keep things simple. I'm going to have a mix of guests, maybe just do some shorter tips and share some of my experiences as I try to improve my spearfishing and fishing here in Southern California. If you have any suggestions on what you'd like to hear, just shoot me a DM on Instagram and let me know. I also wanted to wrap up 2021 with somebody, if you're in the spearfishing world, might know quite well. His name is Shrek. Well, his real name is Isaac, but he's the host of the Noob Spiro podcast. He has a popular 99 Tips book on spearfishing, and Shrek has built a solid community of awesome spiros around the world. And his podcast is a wealth of knowledge. It's helped me get better at spearfishing. I'm sure it's helped you. He's by far the best in the space. And I love to just kind of help more people know about Noob Spiro. It's, it's just so great. And although Shrek interviews a bunch, a bunch of awesome guests, I don't really think he's ever been interviewed himself. You know, and I want to take this time to really dive deep and help you guys get to know who he is. But before we dive into the interview, this podcast is self-funded, but if you'd like to support, please consider checking out my new shop. It's shop.castandspear.com or consider donating to my Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash castandspear. Now, let's get to meet Shrek. In the space, I already know who you are, but I'd love to hear a little bit of backstory of how you got into the sport of spearfishing. Mm. A backstory. Like, so when I started spearing or when I started in the water, because they're kind of... Intense. I want to hear the, the water. I want to get to the essence. So I grew up in New Zealand. Um, I was born in the top of the South Island in a city called Nelson. But then my family migrated to the North Island to a place called Taranaki, where my mum's family was from. And uh, so I lived there from sort of four or five. And um, we were always sort of close to the ocean and swimming pools played a huge part and stuff. So I started swimming. My, my dad was a competitive swimmer and my mum was really good in the water as well. So we were in swimming pools straight up. And I think from as young as I can remember. And, uh, you know, I think dad had us grabbing coins off the bottom of a pool uh, when we were really young, you know, six or seven. And so confidence in the water was was a big was a big part of growing up. And I think probably early teens started boogie boarding or bodyboarding. And, um, and hitting the surf. And mum and dad always sort of car- encouraged involvement in sort of sports and stuff. So I think at, like in the pool and in the surf, we I became, went through like bronze medallion and lifeguard stuff um, sort of simultaneously and also did competitive swimming as well. And just loved it. Like the, the summer summertime in New Zealand, obviously around Christmas time is um, in the Southern Hemisphere, is a huge like six or seven week school holiday period so me and my uh, two younger brothers would be down at the local swimming pool um every day we could and um and there was a big diving pool there it's four meters deep and uh i just love spending time on the bottom and swimming backwards and forwards and stuff so that's probably how all the free diving sort of stuff started i didn't know what it was called in those days though and then did you have a friend who introduced you to the whole freediving aspect or how did nah. that transition from the pool to the the beautiful ocean go so I, I guess like about 18 i was um i got laid off a job uh <laughs> one of my first jobs i didn't do well at school at all uh, it really disconnected and uh didn't the the schooling process didn't work very well for me or my brothers at all so um you know like working sort of uh laboring job and it was a seasonal work and I uh, got laid off and I was in a period of unemployment and my, my parents gave me an ultimatum. Um, you, you're going to have a, a job or be on a course by the end of next week or or you're out, you know. And uh, this is, uh, it doesn't sound real glamorous. It's not, I guess. Um, and, I, and I found this eco-tourism adventure course, which was like um, 
hospitality based stuff with a whole lot of adventure tourism stuff built in and a big part of that was um, scuba diving and up to rescue diver level and so I got in on this and it was it was a really cool program I, I met a whole bunch of young people that were kind of just like me um, and we thought we were heading into this adventure tourism space which is a pretty big industry in New Zealand like um, if you've seen pictures and stuff of it like tourism is a big part of the economy uh, well pre-COVID it was anyway but um but basically we got i got through the end of this course and we got up, upsold on doing the next one and the next one so i did a master a master master diver stuff and then i went through to a master scuba diver instructor and while i sort of started doing this i started leaving my scuba diving gear in the boat and um got hold of a few like hawaiian slings and started shooting butterfish and and really sort of all of the stuff I did in the swimming pool when I was younger started um, just adapting it into the ocean, really. And that was when it all started. And, um, yeah, so that's that was when the spearing started. And then I had a big, long layoff. Um, sort of, I moved to Australia in my early 20s. And there was a few years where I just didn't get organised. I didn't have the network. But I always loved the ocean, so it was always going to happen. And then uh, I met a couple of friends, or one friend that was interested in particular. He just turned out to get really badly seasick. But um, we would just shore dive together and... Um, Neither of us knew anything, so it was the blind leading the blind. And um, but I had a lot of fun just diving around headlands from shore. But the it was quite difficult, and it was difficult to find more dive buddies, and difficult to find places to go, and also really tough to try and meet people to get out on boats and stuff like that. And uh, so yeah, that was how that's how Spearing started, I guess, <clears throat> for me. It's funny when I was chatting with Brett, who you had on the podcast. He was saying the same thing about how he started with the whole scuba tanks. And then eventually he was just like, this is just cumbersome. I can hit these depths with just holding a breath. Yeah. So it's kind of funny how it usually migrates. That's how I even got into spearfishing was, uh, you know, I was doing a paddy course. And then yeah. you just, you know, eventually you're like, why do I need this this breathing tank? <laughs> I just, I can hold my breath. This is not that deep. Yeah. So it's, um, that's awesome too. Do you, you live in New Zealand right now, right? Or did you move? No, I migrated to Australia uh 20 2004 and um apart from sort of moving further afield for a couple of years uh i'm back uh back in brisbane australia so on the sort of the east coast and um the water off here is amazing like uh we get the best of both worlds you get a lot of sort of colder water species and then we get the tropical stuff as well and we have tropical reef as well um it is quite difficult like you've got a travel by by boat for an hour to get out to really where where the productive grounds start or you can drive south to the gold coast for an hour or north to the sunshine coast for an hour and then the reef systems start much closer in but we get we get a, a lot of the same uh fish that they get up up well, not so much where you are, but on the other side of the coast around Florida, there's, there's some similarities like king mackerel and stuff like that. Cobia. Gotcha. Mm. Absolutely. I wish I knew you back when I was over in Australia a couple of times. Oh, I used really? to work for a, yeah, I used to work for a company called Invitech and they were headquartered in Melbourne. So right. like after college, I went over to New Zealand, stayed there for two months, and then I did a month in Australia for the first stint. Man, I love it. The, I just, the only place I haven't been to yet was uh, Perth. I haven't been to the West Coast, but... I've, I haven't been there either, so... Um, Maybe we need to take a trip. That'd yeah, be awesome. That, man, the ocean over there is crazy. And uh, especially the, the northern part, when you get up like Exmouth and stuff like that. Well, I look at some of Brody's videos, and I'm just like, I wish I had this in my backyard. <laughs> I have cold water, and it's cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> but when you got into the whole spearfishing aspect of it did you have to overcome any kind of fear was it just like hey the the pool stuff as a kid made the ocean feel not su super scary or was it kind of a gradual process to get comfortable the, in the act of spearfishing i don't think i had met much fear at all like i think because it was a sort of this gradual and steady progression where i never got too far outside of my sort of comfort zone i it was it was it was it was achievable um I encountered the things, the risks, sort of in a in a in a in a gradual way, which I guess is a really nice way to learn. It's not like jumping in and having to deal with sharks on your first on your first dive or something like that, which I have witnessed a few times and I, I felt for the people. But um, no, I think I think um, you know one of the things with with, with spearfishing is when you're facing the water and you get in, like there's this um, there's the state that you you enter into and um, and it's it's very much, it feels a little bit like tapping into some older part of, of, of ourselves, like in terms of um, 
you're in a heightened state so it's like you but your attention and your focus is very much on what you're doing and so and I, and I think in that state it's much easier to deal with um, risks you know like and um, and 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 your your problem solving ability and, and the ability to categorize and understand risk is 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 um is much better. So like it, like when you jump into spearfishing, even if you're dealing with sharks, um, if you've had some exposure to it, then you, you you understand some some techniques around body language and and monitoring them and working with other people in order to manage them, and you, and you learn when you should probably get out of the water and stuff. But I mean, these are the ones you see, but um. But yeah, no, I, yeah, I don't think, you know, like I've been in lots of situations where I have been afraid and, uh, but yeah, it was because of my entry into it. I think it was just this gradual progression where, where the risks, I just sort of slowly um, started to understand them and be able to manage them, I think. Touching on what you were saying about the heightened sense of kind of uh, being in the water is, do you find that some kind as like a way of being an active meditation or is it, does it recharge your batteries? How did how does that all work for you? I read a little bit into the science of this stuff, and then one theory is, you know, like it's. Um, I think it, I think it forces you. You know, like we talk about uh, the mammalian dive reflex. So I think there's this thing where we tap into the parasympathetic, where um, it's like your your body enters into this sort of this more primal state, where all of your the day to day hum and the noise from our the rest of our sort of complicated lives sort of falls into the background. And I think, um, I think, yeah, that's the sort of space that I like to, like to spear in and do these activities from. And so, yeah, so, sorry, can you repeat your question? <laughs> no, you're answering it. It, it. I'm just curious of like, when in, in terms of like the business side of life or the people who are, who are, you know, we're all working and we all have a million things to think about, you know, meditation has become pretty popular over the last decade or so, you know, just the act of sitting in a chair and breathing. But I always thought, for myself is when I got into the water, you know, having your ears with, you know, when you put your head underwater, you can't really hear, uh, you just hear your mind, if anything, the most. Mm. So I'm just curious on like, you know, how that kind of putting your head in the water changes things for you. Like I know for spearfishing, we, we have like a, the focus on our breath. So it's kind of like meditation, but then we have this one singular goal, which is to like to look and be like aware of the situation and, and our objective of catching the fish. So I was just curious if that kind of turns off some of the, the chatter in your mind while you're in the water i think so i think it's kind of like um it, it, if you can use a computer analogy i think it's almost like just clearing the ram it's like all of the stuff that's filling up your operating sort of uh you know intelligence it's like it just clears all that out We're entering into that state that sort of that more primal state when you're in the water and you're hunting and you're evaluating risk and you're you know you're thinking about your body and relaxing and all these things I think it sort of clears your um your your you know your ram and then it's like hitting a bit of a reboot and so I mean it doesn't make stress go away um like if you're stressed about things like money or relationships or whatever I think when you get out of the water those problems don't go away but you come at them in a more refreshed sort of state and um when you're doing the activity I don't think about that stuff most of the time and and I guess if I if I am aware of a lot of background thoughts and stuff when I'm in the water, then I guess that's showing me that I oh, should I be, I really better deal with some of the stuff um, because uh, I can't even do the activities that I love the most without thinking about all this other stuff. But generally, I find I don't I don't, I don't think about stuff. <laughs> and sometimes it's real self. So it's like the girlfriend um, talks to me and, and she, oh, did you you know like did you did you think about me today or whatever it's like no, no I, <laughs> I was I was spearfishing like I literally thought about nothing except spearfishing <laughs> and uh so I almost feel a little bit guilty I think but like I, I'm also a monotasker I don't know if everyone's the same but um yeah like I'm very much I like to be 100% committed and engaged in what I'm doing and spearfishing demands that and and I'm also of that sort of particular personality type that does that as well. So yeah, I'm glad you said that because now that I'm thinking about my dives, I don't really think about anything else either during the dive. Mm -hmm. It's like you you almost can't. Maybe that is the primal brain just like kicking over and saying you have no energy to focus on those pithy thoughts. <laughs> you need to focus on staying alive and then going after your target. Apparently, our brain uses like twenty percent of our energy or something. And uh, I mean, I'm studying psychology at the moment. Um, part of like part of my work um, pace for some of my study. So I'm applying some of this knowledge and thinking about some of the these the you know these frameworks and the and the 
technical aspects of how our brain actually functions in, in this in these spaces. So, but I think um, you know, like spearfishing definitely has a place for helping us, you know, get healthier minds and stuff. And like I said, like I think it's clearing out the ram, and then it gives you a refreshed state to approach some of the other problems. But I I also like the traditional meditation. Like I I did the Headspace app years ago. I haven't done it for years, but I did the Take Ten Challenge. I think I heard it on the Tim Ferriss podcast or something. And um, I actually subscribed for a year and I was going through a whole bunch of crazy stuff at the time and doing that headspace at the guided meditation like I really enjoyed all of a sudden becoming aware of a lot of the underlying stuff that was going on because I think sometimes we just operate in life and we're not even aware of what's going on underneath the surface and it's like um so just sort of you know identifying that there's stuff going on there you know, identifying your actual state when you sit still for five minutes and you listen to someone all of a sudden you, you've become aware of maybe you got stress underneath and stuff and for me it was huge at the time and just like identifying it and, and acknowledging it was there because i think i just i wasn't even aware and and it, and it affects all your actions and the way you behave and interact with other people and um so yeah i think maybe they're complementary i'm not i'm not sure i haven't I haven't thought about it for a while because I haven't done it, but it's something I've been feeling like I should start doing again, um, some form of, of, of mindfulness. Yeah, I feel like if I wasn't doing as much uh, spearfishing, I would be really demanding some more meditation for myself. I always felt like if you can, it's the distance between our thoughts is where our peace lies, and which, which is hard to do sometimes, just sitting in a chair. But for me, when, as soon as I get into the water, it, it just is easier to find those gaps between my thoughts, if that mm. makes sense. That might be super meta or something, but yeah. I just I just like that void because that void is very peaceful. <laughs> yeah. I almost think like, um, like I, I relate that to training in the swimming pool. Like I always think, um, like I go to some free dive training for, for spearfishing. Like it's it's focused on building your spearfishing fitness and stuff. And like it's quite intensive. Like there's not a lot of um, gaps between. There's a little bit of banter, but a lot of it's... Um, uh you know like co2 training type table stuff and that and i find that sort of training is real good for you know entering that that void that you're talking about that that spirit of space between one thought and the next so so that's yeah but um yeah spearfishing and in, in the, in the actual mindfulness apps i think i don't know they all fill a kind of a different space but um i guess they're all good especially i don't know if it's part of being male as well it's like we're, we're just not very uh aware of our own emotional state sometimes as well like um, and then, yeah, I don't know. It leads to bad interactions if you if you if you're not if you don't have a level of awareness at some level. Yeah, absolutely. So, how did how has risk been in your life, like pre and post spearfishing, free diving? Has it changed? Like, because some people that I talk to, they're like, "Well, you're going to do spearfishing. That's a that's a very risky sport." Whereas mm -hmm. some people I talk to who are in the sport, they're like, "It's not really that risky. There's only a couple of things that can go wrong. <clears throat> as long as you're prepared and you have a buddy, generally, it's a pretty safe sport." So, I'm curious on what you're under. Like, what? How do you view risk in your life? Mm. Yeah, it's it's good. Uh, yeah. When I was starting spearfishing, my workplace was undergoing a, a paradigm change with the way they approached and managed risk, and it was over the top. But some of the tools and techniques that they taught us, I started to apply to spearfishing. And um, one of them was just this idea called Take Five, which was like... Um, which was like just just sit back for 30 seconds really and just look at what it is you're about to do and then think about um what are the possible consequences what's the likelihood that they could occur and what's the, what's the seriousness of them happening and then so i i started applying that even to to spearfishing so like for example when i was shore diving particularly in a new location i'd i'd try and find a vantage point where i could overlook the area that i was diving and um and obviously you're looking for the the biggest risk factors so um the, and the biggest risks generally aren't sharks it's it's um obviously there's the shallow water blackout side of things with free diving if, particularly if you're doing it by yourself so we take a buddy um but in terms of shore diving the the risks generally are like current um and and swell how the how the surf's sort of hitting where it is you go and then you want to have really safe 
um, exit points and you want to have multiple exit points in case you need to, you know, get out in a hurry or, or the current moves you along or whatever. And so really sort of planning out um, from a strategic point where you're going to enter the water, where you're going to exit. And then, um, you know, analysing current and the way boat traffic works around an area, they're probably the biggest risks. And so, and then just sort of using this risk sort of uh, management, this idea of like, okay, consequences, likelihood, seriousness, and then just sort of getting the risk to an area that's acceptable because there is inherent risk in spearfishing. But I think getting it to an acceptable level and the other thing, I think a lot of stuff that's fun is risky, you know, like riding a motorbike really fast is super fun. But, you know, managing managing the risk is, is obviously what you want to do if you want to stay alive and provide for your family and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, so that's that's probably briefly how I sort of look at risk. Do you do you ride a motorcycle? I don't at the moment, but um, I have done in the past and I will do again in the future. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I do, I'm not in a place at the moment where I can buy the motorbike that I want. But my work would, it would be very helpful commuting and uh, and I really like riding a bike. Um, it's just a, a lot more, you're a lot more involved in the in the process of, you know, like when you're in a car, it just sometimes, I don't know, just there's nothing active about what you're doing. Whereas riding a motorbike, I think sometimes you're you're much more involved in the process. And uh, I don't know, I just like, I like it. I got, maybe I'd compare it with like free dive spearfishing and scuba dive spearfishing, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> no, I was just about to say that because it's like, you're not the uh, first person who brings up motorbikes when I bring up this question. And I ride a bike, you know, and I feel like it's the same thing. It's like, you have to be you know, really present of your entire situation. Like mm. to me, it's like the cars or the sharks, you know, or the boats or whatever. Yeah. But you have to be a hundred percent thinking three steps ahead of who's who's out there going to kill you because you're pretty much you know generally going to be in control. But it's the the outside factors. But it's yeah, it's a risky thing. But if you are smart about it, it's not super risky and it's a lot more fun. So yeah, it's just sure. it's kind of nice parallels right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a super it's super fun riding a motorbike, and uh, you only have a number plate at one side of the vehicle as well. And the police seem a lot more. I don't say they're going to condone, you know, dangerous riding or whatever, but they seem to be a little bit more, give you a little bit more leeway to people on motorbikes than they do to people in cars. So, yeah, I like it. Absolutely. Now, when you go spearfishing and you get a whole bunch of catch, do you usually just bring it in at home for your family or do you like to share it with like your friends and the community around you? Yeah, I, it's like everything, you know, like I've got a friend who has invested a bit of time in me teaching jiu-jitsu and I work with him and um, he teaches me stuff all the time and he's a brown belt and I'm still a white belt and like just the, it's a little bit like when you go out spearfishing like and a really experienced person, you don't even know how good they are but they take you out and then, you know, years later, then you, you turn around and you go, wow, that, that, that guy who's that good took time out of his time spearfishing to teach me, you know, like it's a real honor, you know, and, um, and I, it's the same thing with my workmate with jujitsu, you know, so I like, I gave him a whole bunch of fish. Like last time I got back from a, from a reef trip and, you know, like I, I think, you know, just saying thank you with, with fish is awesome. It's one of the things that, um, that, that spearfishing allows us to do. Um, but a lot of the time I, you know, I just like the simple stuff. Feeding my family is, is, is massive, you know? And, um, a lot of the time though, like, like I said, it's like an hour in the boat to get out to where we go. And then, um, you know, you're in the water all day diving end to end. You've got to wash all your equipment and all the rest of it. You get in, you've got all this awesome fish, and then you're just so so tired, so buggered that, you know, you, you just, um, you can't put your best efforts into cooking. So like, I'm pretty simple. I like, like panko crumb, uh, like yellowtail kingfish, or I, I love sashimi, uh, heaps of fish, but, um, yeah. And getting my son into eating that, he's really young, but he'll have, he'll have, he'll, he'll eat sashimi and whatever, whatever I make. So, um, yeah, I love that part of it. Love putting food in front of people. That's awesome. Have you tried dry aging any of your fish or do you like to do it straight fresh? I feel like... <clears throat> Are you talking? You talking the whole fish cookbook type stuff? Is this, is yeah, it? yeah, I've read yeah. that book cover to cover. I thought it was great, and I love it too. Um, but I just sort of got a little bit overwhelmed with regards to the the, the technical sort of side of it. Like you, you really need a dry aging like place to put it, like a cooler or or a, you know like a what do you call the like it's you know some place to put it i don't i don't really have the facilities for that ha, ha, have you done it and what and how did you do it i've been doing it quite a bit um generally with fish that are probably less than 16 18 inches so more of the smaller reef fish that we have the sheephead or the perch it's definitely great for perch if you want to do sashimi but you take a knife 
and you cut off the scales just very carefully to leave, but leave the skin on. And then you have it gutted. Uh, then you just put paper towels inside the gut cavity and you wrap it around um, the outside uh, with the paper towels. And then I put it in the refrigerator for up to like five, six days. And I just flip it over um, every day just okay. kind of to let one side dry out. And then you'll just see it. It'll, the moisture will just kind of leave a little bit and the texture and the flavor is just super, it's enhanced and it okay. doesn't smell like fish. It's great. My buddy, Matt, who introduced me to that book, his family owns a seafood restaurant and they have the full walk-in uh, mm -hmm. refrigerators, but they have all the kingfish <clears> and <throat> the, the white sea bass. And they do this whole process of cutting off this, this, the scales and hanging it in the racks, but it's game changing, man. It makes even uh, pan searing fish just 10 times better. And the fact that you leave the skin on makes that crispy kind of chicharrone uh, type yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. It's great. Highly recommend it. So does it tank everything else in the refrigerator? Do you have a, a separate one or a separate one for, for fish? I currently use one fridge just because um, we only have one fridge at the moment, but it doesn't really make anything super bad. The stink comes if you don't, if you leave fish in like a moist area. Yeah. But the fact that you're wrapping it up in the paper towel kind of prevents it from getting that, that kind of eggy smell. Okay. Um, granted, if you leave it in for too long, sure. But a lot of times, even after six, seven days, you pull it out and you just smell it. And the eyeball's clear still. There's no smell. And you're like, all right, well, this is great. And just mm. cut it up and eat it. Yeah. That was one of the huge things I got out of that book, too. It's just like um, not not feeling like you have to wash a fillet. And like after you've, you know, taken the skin off and all the rest of it, like just drying it off with a paper towel is far more effective than washing it. It's almost like um, you, you start the deterioration process when you add water. I guess that's also the big the big secret because you, I don't wash it. And that's why I think the smell comes from you wash it and you, then you just put it in the fridge in like a plastic bag like or a Ziploc bag like some people do. Mm. And then, of course, it's going to get pretty rancid after two or three days because of all that bacteria and, and that environment. But if you mm. dry it off, like you said, and put the paper towels and just keep it dry, there's nothing to grow and, the, and there's no smell off gassing. I'm going to try it. Thanks, John. Yeah, dude. His whole book, I just can't get into the... I don't feel comfortable yet using the organs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm That's... sorry, man. I see the picture, but I don't know what the heck to do. <clears throat> yeah. I found elements of the book. It's like he's written the book and he's 10 years into a journey that most of us are only just starting. So there's some like really big picture ideas and stuff that I've taken. Um, just in terms of like not not using the same cooking techniques with all different fish like some fish are really good for particular ways of cooking and preparing it and, and it's almost like you know like he uses the analogy of like you don't treat pork like you treat beef and you don't treat lamb like you know and all the different cuts we treat it all differently and cook them all differently and we and the same level of understanding should be applied to fish because they're all different some of that sort of higher level stuff like i really liked but his recipes and stuff i found most of them too intimidating but yeah yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think it's just baby steps. And that's where I'm at. It's like if I can get if I can master the art of just dry aging, then I've already upped my fish game because the flavor and the texture will be better in all my dishes. And yeah. then it's like as I become more and more, you know, comfortable, there's a guy, his name that I, fo I follow um, on Instagram. We've become really good friends now. His name is Matt Bond. And yeah. it's nice to be able to find these kinds of quiet guys on social media who yeah. are just masters in the kitchen, but they mm -hmm. don't like brag about it. They don't do any of this stuff. But then as soon as you get word of mouth that, that they are so good then you can just like start pinging them about like what do i do here like what do i do about this fish and that and then you just kind of soak up their knowledge that's been super yeah. helpful too i've got an interview coming out with a dude from a smokehouse in new zealand and we talked a lot about some of the ideas and that and um it sounds like you've got a few good ones coming for cast the spear too uh in terms of interviews or ideas of... have you got have you gone in and done any videos with those guys i've been doing some videos on my youtube channel that are kind of like around we call quote unquote trash fish just some of the perches that most people don't really care about here yeah. and that's been a big thing especially from what m my buddy matt was saying you know it's most people think a fish is trash because they don't know how to prepare it but simple things like the dry aging will completely change your mind like i blind tasted tested a uh, like a white perch a black perch uh, a half moon and most of these people would never consider even spearing one of these fish but when you have it in sashimi it tastes better than some tunas 
You know, it's like, oh, whoa, yeah. what the heck is that? And and then you'll hear from these guys. They'll be like, well, you know, the the Japanese love these small fish because they're just packed full of flavor. And, you know, it's just something that they do in their culture, but we don't do it here. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. how much do we just not think about what, what, you know, it's like just cultural norms. That's what, what kind of annoys me. It's like yep. there's cultural norms that need to g- either be revisited or killed. <laughs> and, yep. and one of them is trash fish, in my opinion. Um, I embarrassing was reminded of this lesson like two weeks ago. Um, we've got a friend that we take out on the boat and he's still struggling with free diving and relaxing. And he's this hyper competitive dude comes from an MMA background and he's really good at it. Like, but he's a competitive sort of type A type person and he just throws himself at things and spearfishing. You've got to approach really quietly. And so he struggled a little bit with the free diving side of things. But he always shoots these fish that are considered trash here, which is Morwong. And like, there's a few different varieties of them, like, and a lot of them we call mother-in-law fish, you know, because they're only fit to give to your mother-in-law. <laughs> but um, but uh, he he cooks them up in a variety of different ways, and he served it to everyone, and we're all, like, there's a bunch of us that are his dive buddies, and we don't shoot these fish much for it. And so he served this stuff, and we're expecting, oh, no. You know, because these are the fish we all start on, but and uh, he served it up, and and we're all just like, holy moly, this is the best. And uh, it's just, but he knows how to cook it, and he's, you know, like he shoots that many of them. We we th- sort of thought he's an animal just shooting them because you should, we thought surely he can't be enjoying them, but the way he cooks it, it's just awesome. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I wish there was more, you know, cooking shows, even if it's just on YouTube, just focusing more on the local fish. Because I'm, I'm a big mm. proponent of like sustainability. And I just don't understand how we think that we can do long lining and netting. And like, I totally respect commercial fishermen. It's a hard job. But there's just so many things that these resources are going to be depleted if we're not a little bit smarter. And there's a lot of fish that yeah. just aren't pressured that are amazing. It's just like going back to it, cultural norms, just we don't give them the time of yeah. day. And it's just education. It's always education in my eyes. So it's like somebody has to find the motivation and the drive to make the content to then share and try and influence some other people to do to see the world in just a little bit different light. Not necessarily saying that things are bad the way things are. It's just there's other options. It's interesting. Have you seen, have you, do you know Eric Keener with uh, finandforage.com? I have. I've talked to Eric before Finn and Forage was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Cool. Me too. Yeah. Um, I think that's those sort of channels are coming along and they're, they're, they're going to start changing some hearts and minds with regards to this sort of conversation as well. Like, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's got some good ideas there. Yeah, I, I'm all for for building up that kind of community. Like, and I think there's pockets, you know, even if it's he's NorCal, I'm SoCal, you know, there's all the different countries. Mm-hmm. It just needs to have somebody have some motivation to just kind of start a grassroots movement and expand outwards. Mm-hmm. So I respect anybody who's willing to to try it. Cool. Going going into um, into how do you prepare yourself? Do you like, are you the kind of guy who likes checklists? Because I know like doctors, they like to have their kind of procedurals and same with pilots. Um, And those are both generally, you know, like life or death kind of things. You know, a pilot can crash if they don't do something right. Doctor can kill somebody. You know, spearfishing is the same way. Do you, are you one of the types who has things planned out ahead of time? Or is it just kind of fly by the seat of your pants? Um, uh, I am retrospectively systematic. So that means I do things, bugger them up, and then I go, oh, okay, I need to make checklists for that. And then I'll think about it and I'll create a really good system so I do it better next time. And then I follow the system until I get to a point where I no longer follow the checklist, but the process has become internalized. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Do you have any uh, recommendations on how you build out your systems? Is it just, you know, you kind of look back and you just write write it down and that's it? or is there some other methodology i guess i need a context uh sort of to put wheels on this like can you think of like a specific activity or thing where i need to make a system well i I would say for example you know i'm going to baja next week and i know ahead of time that 
that's a five day trip into the middle of nowhere. You know, these are the kinds mm -hmm. of conditions that are likely to be seen. These are the kinds of gear that I'm probably going to need to take. So a week out, I should probably, I've done this trip before. So I should have some kinds of like, oh, do this. And then like, oh, the day before do this. And then yada, yada. While I'm in the water, try, you know, there's just things to kind of cement down on paper. So that's not just in your head. And then you're mm -hmm. like, ah, because you know, we've been on the Pongo where we get out to the dive spot and we have that one buddy who, oh, I forgot my fins on the on the car seat. <laughs> you know, it's like things like that where I'm just like, well, that never needs to happen if we just had, because I like this program called Notion and Notion allows you to yep. kind of build out essentially a second brain, you know, and then can be synced to your phone and all that stuff. So I'm like in the process of making all these different like spearfishing dive related pages that I can just share with people so that they can just be like, oh, this is my template for this kind of dive. This is my template for the standard gear that, or checklist before I go on a trip, you know, stuff like that, where I'm like, you shouldn't, mm -hmm. none of this stuff is new. Like we, we do the, all the same mm -hmm. stuff. It, and if we can, if we do it all the time, we should have it documented somewhere. That's all I'm curious about was just like systems, <clears throat> out outsourcing stuff and how you do it. I'm like you, I think. I I like to be quite systematic. I tend to enjoy creating my own systems and processes, though, because there's something about ordering the things in your own mind when you write out a checklist that force you to, you know, be quite procedural. And then, and then you know, comparing your checklist with others can be interesting as well, because then you can sort of improve on things and, and adapt a little bit. But um, I guess with your one, like, I would probably have a few things like I would have a, a checklist for for an extended trip um, and I would probably send that checklist to the other people that were going on that trip to help them and then I would prepare a bit of an itinerary like so it would have day one through five and then in each day I would try and um, put down some of the core um, activities that I wanted to make sure I did you know um, <clears throat> I go so far as to Sometimes I have gags and jokes that I think about and I, you know, but you can only pull them off when you're in a crowd or with the right type of people. So I'll write them down and I'll, you know, and I think it, one thing I was talking about before, like being very monofocused too, like when I go spearfishing, I don't really like to film. I, in fact, I'm not, if I did that, I wouldn't be good at spearfishing. I'd, I'd just be, I'd have my resources spread too thin. I think, um, so, so yeah, so like, I mean, with with planning gags and stuff like I, I I'll, I'll chuck it down that way I can get the other people to have a look at it and they can play a part in it too but um yeah so I would have an itinerary I'd have day-to-day -day itemized things that I wanted to do even if it was just like four or five dot points and uh, I'd make sure I, I sort of um had a had a good look at those while I was on the trip and just sort of made sure I did all the things I wanted to do and you know it's, it's good to sort of reflect and think after a trip about what you could have done better or whatever and then Obviously, the next time you do that trip, it, it's, um, you know, the, some of the novelty's gone because you've already been there before, but, you know, you're better prepared to, to pull it off the way you wanted to the first time. So, yeah, I like that um, that 5P thing as well as uh, prior, uh, what is it? Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Yeah. Um, you know, so, th yeah, I, I like I like to be prepared, but sometimes um, it's the things that you're not prepared for that are the most fun as well. But um, you know, planning doesn't stop those things from happening, so there's no excuse for not for not planning and, and doing things the best you can. Mm. I agree with you on that because I used to always think that planners were the people who didn't live a spontaneous life. So they're always disciplined mm. and rigid and stuff like that. But it wasn't until I read Jocko's book where I was like, oh, it's the discipline equals freedom. Discipline gives you the space to then have this, the positive mm. spontaneity happen in your life. And I was like, oh, that mm. makes a lot more sense <laughs> versus just yeah. the a reactionary human being traveling through this world. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's heaps of stuff like along this. Like, I'm, like when you've got things dialed in and you do things in a routine, you no longer have to think about them or apply a whole lot of um, willpower. And, I mean, willpower is finite. So if you've got a whole lot of things dialed in that you just do because that's what you do and it's who you are, you don't actually have to think about it. You know, like Jocko's got his 4.30 wake up or whatever it is every morning that he shares on his Instagram. And, I mean, he's he seems like an incredibly disciplined dude, but I think a lot of it's just being systematic and then bedding some of those things into routines and habits and he no longer has to think about them he just doesn't yeah absolutely yeah. what other resources because i feel like we've read the same books think the same way <laughs> what else have you done that i probably have done as well 
Well, um, I like Jocko. I really like um, just talking about him. I, I really like the Warrior Kid podcast and um, his children's books. Like I've got a um, seven-year-old son coming up eight and like his kids' books are just awesome. You know, like there's none of this waffly sort of crap. There's like stuff in there for helping, um, you know, young kids become powerful people. And um, so I really like that just while we're touching on that. But yeah, man, I like, I think we've touched on a lot of the same stuff, you know. Um, the four-hour work week influenced a whole lot of my my thinking with regards to systemizing things and outsourcing routine tasks um, that's huge and um, you know a lot of people think that they work really hard because they work really long hours but they work so inefficiently that you know they shouldn't really be proud of it they should be more proud of what their output is not their just sheer volume of hours they put into something I mean that that influenced me a lot too because I've been guilty of just doing useless work that wasn't really important but I felt like oh I've worked hard because I've spent so long on this but it's like like, you know, it didn't make any difference. You didn't change any lives. It, it just, you know, you just did a whole bunch of work. Um, so, and, and like, I guess I had a, a work ethic instilled by my dad, which is, um, you know, like, I really respected and valued hard work. But now I tend to value uh, output rather than input, you know. No, I've, um, so. I've been definitely... Um fallen into that trap quite a bit i think they call it parkinson's law especially it's like oh, yeah. you have a lot of time and then you'll just fill up that gap i've also fallen victim to feeling like getting little things done that that act of completion mm. releases that dopamine blast but in reality yeah. it's like that's not doing anything or moving the needle like whereas you yeah. can build out a system once put in the hard thought and you know you spend a couple hours or a day or whatever you need to but then it's working for you like you don't have to yep. think about it again you have somebody else doing that task and i'm like oh and it wasn't until i had some time to reflect recently uh like one of my times in college that i was you know the most productive was when i I, you know, had two jobs. I was the president of like my pledge class in a frat. I was doing like, I basically had zero time to just sleep. That's about it. You know, that's like, I had something to do, but I was productive. And I've kind of applied that right now because it's like I'm running two companies. I, I'm <laughs> fixing up a, a house from pretty much a, like a total fixer upper house at night, three times a week. I basically don't have much time for anything, yeah. but it's like my output, that out, external squeeze where you don't have time makes you have to be a lot more efficient. And if you're not efficient, you burn out and you die. <laughs> so it's kind of like, a, <laughs> you can't do it for super long, but sometimes these external constraints you can put on yourself really help. How do you do time off? What does that mean? When do you turn off? When do you, when do you, when do you just have a downtime? Honestly, lately it's, it's actually the spearfishing is the downtime. It's the yeah. time it takes to get to the place. Then I get to like hang out with a friend or a dive buddy. I get to be in the water for X hours and I come back and I'm usually tired, but it's, that's why I'm, I'm so interested in this kind of book thing. <laughs> I shouldn't be able to do all the stuff that I've been doing. Like I just shouldn't, mm -hmm. like I've talked to people, like I'm like, people look at outside and they're like, what the hell are you doing this? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, honestly, it's kind of like the meditation, you know, it's like if you go out for a dive and it's three or four hours, sure, you're using energy. But if you're if you're doing it right, you shouldn't be using a lot of energy. You should just be kind yeah. of like relaxed and you should be able to do your dives and you did something satisfactory of like getting that fish or you 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 just put in the effort. Yeah, I don't know. It's better than sleep sometimes for me, you know, because my sleep isn't the <laughs> best, but it, like, it cancels each other out for a little bit. Another thing I learned off Tim Ferriss was reading fiction before sleep at night. Do you do that? When I do it, I like it. I just can't get myself to do it that much. Um, I, I should really try to do it more. What fiction do you like? Do you sci-fi? Do you have anything specific? Yeah, I love sci-fi. I love sci-fi. Like the thing I, the reason I do it is because, like, I'm very much a problem solver, and I like working through systems and sort of ideas in my mind and categorizing things and and you know. Sometimes going to bed with a problem in your mind is good too because your, your brain works on stuff while you sleep. However, the, the downside of that sometimes is you just need a good night's sleep. So like reading fiction just puts my mind in storytelling mode and um, and, and I, I'm just not stuck in that same grind. Um, but yeah, I love, I love sci-fi. I like, I like all sorts. Eh? I like, I like um, his, um, it's like um, historical fiction. So it'll be set in a in a time and context where some major event happened, but they put fictitious characters in there. So you've got more of a, uh, 
a, a person's real perspective on what happened. So the, the events and stuff might all be historically accurate and true, but the people that are in the story that, you know, give you the background, they're, they're not real. And I like things like that, you know, like, um, oh, there's a, there's, I've got a few examples of that, but that, but they're kind of books that I like, because then you learn about history, but you get that first person perspective. It's, um, yeah, that, that can be a real fun way to do stuff. That reminds me of the Dan Brown books, the yeah, uh, but Angels and Demons I, and yeah, stuff like I that. Fan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, I I've, only, I've only read one, but uh, it just yeah. rem- I just remember the movie. Did you ever read Dune? Uh, no. Dude. I found um, I started it, and I just found it. It was like Lord of the Rings for 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 um, sci-fi, like mm. long, drawn out, overly detailed without a lot of um, real good characterization of the people. But having said that, I read it at a much younger age, so maybe now I'd be ready to, to do it. I'm not sure. Now I need to go pick up some new books, man. I have I've have a bad <laughs> habit of reading too much like nonfiction, productivity, help, you know, that kind of thing. And it's funny, it's like over time, they all become repetitive. Like mm. you just got to go do it. You got to go just yeah, put yourself yeah. out into the world and go grind and execute. Nobody's going to tell you the answer. There's no silver bullets. You just got to kind of take a risk and go. Yeah. I try and do like 10 or 12 nonfiction books a year, but I'll, I'll do a lot of it over Audible these days. Um, but that's why I kind of like the historical fiction too. It's because you can read a, a book that's got practical re- relevance and it's real, but there's a, it's still fun. And, and I don't know, it's just kind of, relatable and uh, i don't know it's different another one i really liked uh fairly recently was it's called the social animal by um david brooks and yeah. um but it's like social theory and you know like um all, all different psychology sociology anthropology all of the latest research is sort of was worked into this book however it's the story of one guy and it starts before he's born it starts with his parents how they met each other and how their relationship started and then it follows his whole life right till after he dies. And all the way through this book, he ties in the latest um, in all this social science research. And um, he's a practical sort of guy, but it's it was really, that was a really interesting way to do it. You know, like just looking at all the different social dynamics that play out in our lives from how we form relationships to how we go through jobs and all that stuff. It was really, it was really cool. I'll have to check out that book. Speaking, mm-hmm. speaking of, death have you ever had a close call spearfishing i've had heaps of stuff that have scared the shit out of me but i haven't um no i can't really say that anything's um come close you know like i've had big shark boil ups right on my fin tips and i've been um swept sort of out to see a bit in a current and um i've been separated from the boat uh my friend anchored up and then the current swang and I, you know like i was just arm over arm swimming back at the boat and it took probably half an hour to swim maybe 50 meters and uh that was pretty scary um but no nah, nothing like nah, nothing where i felt like i was gonna die so, yeah oh that's good i had a close call mm-hmm. the other day it was not yeah, whatever it was something relatively stupid you know I, I got my ego get in the way and i was in on, on a trip i was diving with some buddies we we're at catalina we're on the boat it was the first dive so it just basically got in the water but instead of kind of sticking with my dive buddy uh, there was just three of us and then those two guys kind of hung to the side. And then I was like, oh, well, I can kind of see him. I'm just going to kind of go this way for a little bit. And I saw this white sea bass. And this is something that mentally I've been trying to get for since I started this sport. And I'm like, oh, there it is. I finally have it. And I take the shot and it, you know, I hit the fish and it wraps around the kelp. And it's probably only about tied up 35 feet or so and i just my adrenaline's going crazy and i'm not doing the proper breathe up and i kind of like i just had a flopper and usually the fish's flesh is pretty soft and you generally have a slip tip so i'm like oh crap this fish that i finally got is going to like rip off and i'm going to feel like an asshole so i dive down really quickly without a proper breathe up and i get down i look i grab the fish but I c- it kind of slips out. It wraps around, like with my real line, it wraps around the kelp and my legs. And I'm like, oh shit, like I should really, uh, you know, s- 
in my head, I was like, and then I, but then I grabbed the fish. So I'm holding onto the fish. I'm tied up and I'm like, for whatever reason, I couldn't get myself to let go of the fish and grab my knife. And I'm just like holding it. I'm just like, everything shut off. I'm like, in my head, I was like, I should just pull off my weight belt. I should just let go of the fish. I should just cut this thing. But for whatever reason, it kind of just like froze. And then I'm like, oh, wow, I've kind of been down here for a while and I'm not really doing anything productive to get myself out of here. Um, And I'm and I'm like, I just started kicking. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I could probably do. But I just started kicking <laughs> as hard as I could. And I like ripped out the kelp with just the thrust, but I barely made it to the surface. Uh, oh, and just like, took a big breath. And I'm just like, everything was stupid in this moment. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? For whatever reason, yeah. I kept the fish, we kept the fish, but it's just like, that wasn't worth it. I really need to start figuring out some ways to do some more muscle memory in terms of safety. And sure, I should have like, A, the dive buddy should have been closer and watching me and, and all that stuff. But yeah, things can change. I was like, wow, I'm really going to just croak on the first dive. This is stupid. <laughs> but if you had gone out like that, um, would that have been a bad way to go? No. I mean, there's other worse yeah. ways, but honestly, no. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, it's a good question, but it's like, I don't know. There's an element of, you know, when you head out on your own and you leave your mates and you go and chase a fish, you know what you're doing. And you, to an extent, I, th- I think personally, like, we take on that risk. We, it's like, yep, we'll 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 pay the cost, you know. And it's like, I don't know. There's a few times in life where you do it, you know, um, and you choose to do it. It's kind of, it's not, you're not 100 percent analyzing the risk, and you know, but you do take responsibility for what you're doing. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it would have. There would have been a lot of people sad, but I also mm-hmm. don't think my. It would have changed if I was like a dad. Like right mm-hmm. now, I'm not. You know, so there's still a little bit of me where I'm, I'm like, yeah, I can be a little bit more risky. But yeah, I mean, the downstream yeah. consequences are going to be the whole family is going to be distraught forever and all those kinds of things. But I don't yeah. know. It's the same reason why you get on a bike. Like, you, yeah. you, know, you can hit any time, any intersection, some stupid person can be on their phone and nail you. It's like, mm. you know, you're out as long as you don't suffer. I, you know, like my mom passed away from cancer and she had to go through it for like six years, you know, multiple surgeries, radiation, all that stuff. And I'm looking at, she's like one of the strongest people that I know, but that was pure misery. And I'm like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, for me going out on a, on a spearfishing or going out because I took a, like a big wave at Jaws or something like that. I'm like, well, you know, that's not the worst way. I sure. I, I think living yeah. a long life is, is precedent. Do your best. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you are going to go out. Go out doing something cool. Don't be lame. There's this there's this thing in our culture that you know, like it's like we don't accept death. You know, like and we, and we we think it's terrible when someone dies, like you know, like younger in life. And it's like, well, at least we are living. Do you know what I mean? Like, but like a spear spearfishing is risky, you know. And you know, we talked about riding a motorbike, or whatever. But like it, it, these things make life fun and they give it value. And you know. That, while they are inherently risky, they they're freaking they're the things that give it value, you know. Like so, I, you know, like if I got spearing, like you know, yeah, I'd leave the sun behind, and and that'd suck. And maybe there is something a little bit selfish about that. It's not like I'm choosing to die though. It's but it's you know, I want my son to live as well. You know, I don't want him to. I don't want him to just live this boring formulaic life where everything's neatly categorized and he never does anything outside of it because it's you know. Um, too risky you know like i mean there are things that are too risky don't, don't get me wrong i mean growing up as part of it is sort of understanding and dealing with risk but you know accepting risk and doing things in spite of it is also part of the joy and freedom of life i think you know so yeah i don't know um yeah it's tragic when it happens but it's also i don't know it's part of it yeah i think that's where it comes down to we can enjoy this for a long time if we do a couple things religiously and that's and that's i think what the near death helps when you do it yourself or when you go through it yourself because there's we can talk till we're blue in the face not like every spear fisherman hasn't heard that you need a buddy you know there's a gazillion different Mm. things but it's only when you have your own close call that you're like oh that's what they're talking about so now it's like i'm glad it happened why because now i am not afraid to be that newer spiro who is more religious about the safety aspect of things like now it's fresh in yeah, the mind yeah. you know so now i'm like yeah. okay cool like i don't have any bravado it's kind of that's why it's like jujitsu right it's like i that was that was the ocean's way of giving me my chance to tap 
<laughs> and I was lucky enough to tap and she let go. That's really where I, it yeah. came down to. So I'm like, okay, cool. Now I get it. I could easily die. All right. Yeah. Let's just be a little bit smarter. I, I prefer to dive in a, in a system now. Like I prefer to dive with others uh, in a buddy system. And like I travel every now and then and I go spearing with people and, and they don't. And I, everyone's more or less just diving on their own. Um, we're out there together, but, and I, I never relax anymore as much as I do when I'm with, with my crew, you know, like we, you know, and I don't know when, when people have this, the same drive and they like buddy diving and like, gee, was, it's awesome. It's, it's more fun. It's like a higher level of, of like, um, spear and I, I mean, sometimes when you're in the shallows and you're hunting and stuff, I mean, you, you need to solo dive to, well, or not completely solo dive, but you, you definitely have your buddy, your dive buddy has to be on to what you're doing. Um, like if they're overhead of you and you're in like 30 feet of water, you're not going to shoot any good fish. Like, um, because all those fish have now got two potential predators and you know, their, their risks, um, sense of, you know, danger is too high. So, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's like so much of spearfishing with buddies is learning to work together and, um, just communicating freely and stuff. And so many of us don't do that very well, I think. I would agree with you on that. I was talking about it with a dive buddy um, two days ago where I was like, yeah, you know, it's hard to kind of do the one up, one down, especially in the kelp. But you know what we could do is since we're diving relatively shallow, you know, there's a cap. You know, if we're going to be diving above, say, 40, 35 feet, then maybe we just make it a habit where every three to four minutes we do the OK sign visible. And that's to know like on top of the water. And we just do that religiously. We're going to do it like 30 times throughout the dive, but we're close enough and we know that we're okay. You know, whereas um, mm. a lot of times we just kind of go our separate ways and we're like, oh yeah, but w what happens if you shallow water blackout, you get four to six minutes. So I was like, okay, well, if that's the case, as long as we're within say, you know, 10 yards of each other <laughs> doing this a one up, one down. And as long as we're doing this communication sign, you know, that's relatively safe for our conditions. Now, if we're going to be doing anything deeper, one up, one down, religious, you know, watching, hey, your buddy goes down to 60, 90 feet, whatever, cool, we're, we're there, you know, full, full attention. But I don't know, maybe that's dumb, but I'm just trying to think of ways that allow us to get the same kind of safety without being like, oh, you're scaring away all the fish. That's hard, man. Like when you've got like less than say 15, 20 feet of visibility and you're diving with real guns and it's dark and stuff like, um, your buddy will go down in front of you and then he'll come up 20 meters away from you yeah. uh, a minute, a minute and a half later. Um, how do you be a good buddy? I guess you wait for them to surface then you swim over to them and then they follow you, you know, and then it's your turn to dive. I guess that's the way to do it. Um, if you waited correctly, maybe, I don't know. It's, it's real guns like are pretty crazy. Sometimes they definitely get in the way of like, but you guys are with these huge kelp forests. I don't, I'd imagine there's not really much of a way around it. No, there's not really a good way. I mean, the reel is nice in the kelp just because it's just easy to, to navigate. But in reality, it'd be a lot safer to use a float line with like a kelp carrot so that you at least have a tether because even if the guy blacks yeah. out you know where his he dropped his gun and he'll probably be relatively close to it because the current's not going to take him away mm. it's just a little bit annoying it's not that bad though so i don't know i prefer a reel just because it's it's easier but mm. I, um mm. yeah that's all white sea bass mm. is a different game man because they're they're spooky yeah. fish you know a lot of guys they'll swear by going by themselves you know and then, and a lot of the nice thing about the fish is you don't have to go deep. So you're only making maybe 25, 30 foot drops and hopefully seeing them where the thermocline is. And then if they're there, they're there. If they're not, they're not. So I don't know. It's, it's not the most ideal conditions. I wish I was in your part of the world where it's like, you can see 50 foot plus viz and, and have some oh, fun. <laughs> that's on a good day, man. A lot of our diving is the same though. We're honestly in 15 foot of viz a lot of the, a lot of the time. Um, all our inshore shore diving is terrible biz. Um, when we get offshore, generally, like if the wind's in the right direction, though, we, we are getting 30 foot plus, but um, we still dive a, f a fair amount of shitty biz. Gotcha. All right, I want to have uh, two more questions um, for you. I'm really curious on if you could put anything on a billboard and have everybody see it. This is a Tim Ferriss question. What would you want said? Hmm, jeepers. I wish you'd sprung this one on me earlier. I've never even thought about what I would put up there. Let's get, let's, let's come back to it, eh? 
I'll have All to right. think about it. And then I guess my question is just why do you spearfish? I think it provides a, a sense of satisfaction, like at a soul level that nothing else has ever done for me before. And it's like its own unique thing, you know, like, yeah, like we talked about clearing the ram. I think that's part of it. And there's the mindful aspect. There's the feeding the family. There's being like really just actively engaged and 100% present in the moment and sort of all of those things. Yeah, nothing nothing engages me in like quite the same as, as spearfishing. And I don't know, it just fills your soul up, man. <laughs> Love it. So maybe that should be what's on um, your billboard. Get in the water. Go spearfishing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want everyone to. I don't want everyone to spearfish. I do want the people that spearfish and the people that start spearfishing to be intentional about what they do and to take responsibility and to, you know, to try and um, grow their own, grow themselves, you know, in terms of their maturity as a spearer. You know, like taking responsibility of the fish you take and the way you take them, and you know, just being being conscious, you know, of of, of others and, and yourself and, and our resource. And that, that's probably my message to people that do want to spearfish. Um, for a sign, a similar, I think the billboard, I would have um, just take responsibility, probably. Like, um, you know, don't worry about changing the world. You know, like I, I like some of the stuff that's out there, like Jocko and bloody uh, Jordan Peterson. Like, just, you know, make your bed, you know, like do the stuff that's within your control to change and, do that. Don't worry about all the other stuff that's going on outside of your influence. Like, you, you know, you just do the best you can do with what's in front of you. Dude, I love that. Happy. I think extreme ownership and that 12 rules for life were real game changers for a mental shift for me. Just like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people can change themselves and that's the fastest and best way to make the biggest impact on your community and the world. Mm -hmm. well, Shrek, man, I appreciate your time, man. <laughs> no worries, John. I can I can monologue for hours, man. It was good to chat with you. Dude, I love it. Well, that does it for this episode of the podcast. Huge thank you, Shrek, for coming on here and going deep with me. And I can't wait to dive with you out in Oz. It's been a while since I've been back there. but Or better yet, how about you just come out to SoCal and I'll take you out to a few spots or we can do a, a real adventure down in Baja. Uh, if you guys found this podcast fun, please consider subscribing on whatever podcast platform you're using. And if you use Apple Podcasts, it would really help to leave a rating and a review. I read them all. Stay safe out there, everyone. Cheers to 2021, and I'll see you on the next one.